Thank you very much, and good afternoon to everybody. So I'd like you to imagine what it would be like to be the person that was answering these questions, which a psychiatrist asked 51-year-old August Dieter in 1901. First, he asked her, what is your name? And she replied, August. Next, he asked her for her last name, but she again replied, August, I think. And then he asked her, what was her husband's name? And with a facial expression that suggested that she didn't un even understand what the question was referring to, she again replied, August, I think. And throughout this interview, August revealed that she had lost a sense of where she was and even who she was. And she repeated out loud several times, I have lost myself. The name of the interviewer was Dr. Alois Alzheimer. And five years later, when August died of this devastating disease, he looked inside her brain under a microscope. And what he found were these unusual accumulations of naturally produced molecules in her brain known as plaques. And these are what now define what we know as Alzheimer's disease. But 115 years later, we still do not know why the 35 million people who have this disease are progressively losing the function of their brains or how we may be able to prevent or reverse this disease. The fact that these plaques are related to Alzheimer's suggests that it might be a consequence of potentially reversible biophysical effects. And in order to address this problem, we have to think of mental symptoms as dysfunctions of the physical brain. So that is particularly something we can look at is if we can reverse biophysical events of these plaques, could that be related to mental symptoms in Alzheimer's disease? So this is a problem though because the context in which these plaques occur is a very complex context, namely the human brain. And this is the same problem for other brain disorders that don't involve plaques. The brain is a very complex context to consider, and how we've been able to look in brain research uh, for these kinds of treatments is to focus on molecular or cellular properties almost under the assumption that these can uniquely cause disease. Or at the other extreme, we've, we've looked at observing the effects of existing drugs on behaviors. But largely because of lack in technology, we have not been able to look at brain disorders in the context of many cells functioning at once. And in Alzheimer's and in other brain disorders, an essential direction for the future of drug development will be to look at the context of how cells interact in large groups. So I'm particularly interested uh, in this approach because I believe that understanding the physics of our brains can demystify things as complex as what we think of as the functions and dysfunctions of our minds. And I'm going to talk about some of the rationale and results of our research for the past few years that uses computers to simulate the biophysics of interacting brain cells uh, in hopes of providing a, pr a brighter perspective on how to treat brain disorders. So there is evidence for the view that the mind depends on the brain. And this you see here is Phineas Gage, one of neuroscience's most uh, famous patients who underwent a terrible accident in the early 1900s. Uh, in, in this accident, uh, an explosion sent the rod he was carrying through his brain and through his skull and landed a dozen feet away. Remarkably, he lived through this, and also apparently this changed his social habits. Uh, he became a less uh, considerate, uh, he assumed a less considerate personal identity even. So it, it may be the case uh, that you may be a little upset if this kind of accident happened to you, but... The, the specificity, the specificity of, of the effects on his, on his personality correlated to where we think that the specificity of the region of the brain that was affected. So this does contribute to the view that the mind depends on particular regions of the brain. And he's not alone. Uh, this is how primarily we understand how the brain works at first, is looking at physical damage or surgery on the brain affecting things like perception, learning and memory and other phenomena that we associate with the mind. So in order to make progress, we see the mind as the set of operations 
that the physical brain performs. So if we are to look at uh, treating mental symptoms from the physical brain, we should look for where we should look in the brain to treat brain disorders. And the nervous system, of which the primary organ is the brain, uh, is a group of cells that are dedicated to sensing input and producing an appropriate response in the form of behavior. So for example, right now, your nervous systems are accomplishing the task of hearing me as I speak, of uh, deciding what is important for your response, and then creating the response of listening and interacting with these concepts. So this is a complex task, uh, but the cells of the nervous system, most of which are called neurons, are not that intelligent in doing this task by themselves of, of creating responses. Neurons are essentially leaky bags of salt water that can track real properties in the world with their leakiness and then their, thus their electrical activity. Uh, so this is almost, like you can think of it, the neurons are like a flight tracker or especially, neuro, especially sensory neurons are like uh, an airplane monitor where you can represent the position and velocity of the real airplane on terms of the position and velocity on a screen. Uh, and that is what neurons seem to be doing. What's happening on the outside uh, is actually also happening in some form on, on the inside by the activity of neurons in our nervous systems and in our brains. However, the, how the brain functions to generate responses and to make these decisions does not seem to come from neurons, but seems to be more, the fundamental unit seems to be more of groups of neurons acting together. So how is it that groups of neurons can be different from the neurons that make them make it up. So the simplest example of a functional group of neurons is called the knee reflex neural circuit. And what this is is when you put together a neuron that can only sense how much a muscle is stretching, together with a neuron that can only make that muscle contract, you get something different from both. You get a group of cells that helps you keep your balance. So science writer Kevin Kelly summarized this emergence of function when you put things together as more is different. Putting more of, of the same kinds of units together is not going to always give you more of the same, but can give you an entirely new identity on its, on its own, entirely new entity. So when you put together a lot of units, which is the case in the brain, you can get even more complex functions and even different and harder to understand entities that we have to treat as far as functional units of the brain. So right here you see an example of this. You can think of uh, a flock of birds as exhibiting this kind of emergence where there's no single bird or a group of birds that can control what the, the flock does. It's complex motion and it's complex shape. Uh, so it emerges only when the birds interact as a group. And it's, uh, our neurons may be acting in a, in a, like a flock of birds when we store concepts in our brains, where the function only emerges when they come together and is not really visible uh, in terms of like the flight patterns of birds. It's not visible uh, just looking at one bird at a time or one neuron at a time. So for uh, example, one of the theories illustrates this of how our brains are able to accomplish content addressable memory. And this is, for example, if I say the word kezu, you'll, you can recall the word Kalamazoo, and everything you might associate with this city. Kalamazoo College comes to mind, the people that you know here, maybe the experience of the earthquake we had recently. All these things can, can come to your mind and, and are called in a stable form. And how that can be accomplished, we think, is when neurons that represent isolated facts, like those isolated ex experiences, maybe a small group of neurons can do that. Uh, but when they interact as a group, they can represent interactions of facts to form concepts so that uh, the valleys here you see in, in a representation of the entire network state represents concepts that are stable to perturbations such that the activity of all the neurons together makes it so that you can have that concept stable in time. And that's called the Hop, Hopfield network memory model of memory. So we see that uh, the emergence of a function when you have, have groups of, of neurons working together we can also see the emergence of dysfunction when we have groups of neurons working together. And that is the case in, if you're thinking about a particular and pretty simple population behavior, if you just think of the total activity of a population. Uh, this is just, if you add all the, the activities of, of neurons, 
uh, you get that property of a population is the total activity. And this, uh, a disease, a disorder called epilepsy is particularly a disorder of exactly that thing. The property of the population in which the total activity in, in the population is too high and in time so that all the neurons are acting at the same time. And this is what, what happens in epilepsy. And that's an important problem. But we're beginning to see that this same event is happening in other brain disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. So it's been recently noted that Alzheimer's patients have an increased risk and increased incidence of epilepsy-like events in their brain where there's an overactivity on the population level. And more than that, a, a drug that is specific for epilepsy events, so an anti-epilepsy drug, is able to re reverse learning and memory deficits in mice that express Alzheimer's disease, and that's this LEV drug you see here. So this is particularly targeting the network level. And not only does it fix the network level and the behavioral problems, but also fixes some cellular problems that we, are, we know are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So what this suggests is that the network level of activity could be actively contributing to the prog progression of Alzheimer's disease and is something we have to address as an entity on its own. So the next question I want to think about is how do we understand such uh, a complex uh, population activity? So we can actually, there's principles of how neurons interact with each other, and from that we can start to, to understand what kind of population activities will emerge, what other properties of populations might be associated with disease. And so you can think of this as kind of like a mob mentality or herd mentality case, where uh, what you do right now depends on what every, everyone around you is doing. And people will do things in a herd that they wouldn't normally do on their own, or in a group of people. So when that can be explained in terms of neurons adding up the activity of other neurons in there that they're connected to in the whole population uh, in time. So the cells A and B here, if they are firing independently of each other, then you have a certain response in the, in the neuron that they're connected to. Whereas if they're firing at the same time, you get a different response. So the activity of any one neuron depends highly on the activity of the, the neurons in its surroundings. And what one particular other simple population behavior that we would like to understand is that which generates what are called brain waves. And these are something we can observe in an electroencephalogram or an EEG. And how we think of, of this is now we're introducing the concept of a behavior in time of the population. And we think of it as neurons are acting the same in time in order to generate uh, this, this behavior. And also they're behaving periodically and predictably. And this happens to be important for communicating in the population and communicating with other parts of the brain, neurons seem to be doing the same thing. Uh, and also empirically, we know that brain waves in, in the EEG are related to behavioral states, and you need them uh, for things like being alert and, and for having an atten attentive state. So now we need to understand how this happens, because it doesn't just happen by itself, but it's generated at the population level, and we may not be able to understand it at the cellular level. And that's what you see here. These two neurons are starting to look like each other in their activity. How does that happen? Well, if you look at this model, so it's 100 neurons acting together. And if you look at different pairs of neurons where it doesn't actually matter where if they're connected both ways or if they're connected one way or if they're not directly connected at all, they show the same pattern of similarity in their activity, which is necessary for this functional brainwave. So this is, is, a gener is clearly a population-generated activity. And to understand it, we need to uh, look at how it's generated at the population level. So the problem is we still don't have the technology to observe many neurons acting at once. Uh, but what we can do and what we have done for the past few years is to use comp what are called computational models. And this is using computers uh, to represent neurons by equations that are known to represent their behavior on a single cell level well and to incorporate that with the actual connectivity that we see in parts of the brain. So we know that this, these have physiological com compo components uh, in terms of the cells they correspond to, and they should generate periodic activity, but we don't know how unless we look at all the neurons at the same time, and that is what you can simulate in a computer. So what we're able to, to do with that is another disorder that seems to be a population property disorder is anxiety, and it's more a complex population pro pro behavior uh, where the frequency of the brain wave that is produced in anxiety changes and is, is increased in anxiety, and anti-anxiety drugs reliably decrease the frequency of this brain wave. Uh, 
So we're able to suggest new mechanisms uh, by which this reduction in frequency can be, can be achieved, potentially more selective anti-anxiety drugs using that. And then again, we're, we're focusing on looking at all the neurons working together as a unit because that is really what seems to be specific for the function and for the dysfunction of anxiety in this case. And similarly, we're able to suggest mechanisms of Alzheimer's in the molecule that's naturally produced to, pr to form plaques called amyloid beta or A beta. And we suggested across the levels of, of, of neurons as far as they interact, uh, that the timing could be an issue and that at the population level you have a dysfunction that could be used for diagnostics and for explaining the progression of this disease. So again, we need computational models to start to look for population properties that may be going wrong in brain disorders and to actually we can treat them as well by looking for the effects on how that population behavior depends on uh, the lower level drug effects. So when August Dieter was alive, our best approach to uh, treating and trying to help her, her case was to look at those plaques and to see what's going wrong with molecules, with neurons, and with how they communicate with synapses. But what the, the direction now, and what we, we hope will provide hope for people like August today, is to think of Alzheimer's as also an, a network dysfunction, and to look for drugs that can attack this entity, which also seems to be playing a role in the progression, so including circuits and whole, whole brain networks. And these types of computational techniques are going to be an essential step, I believe, to incorporating the group activity and to address how we can solve these, uh, these problems with population uh, activity using, using drugs. And this will provide the, the impetus and the, the foresight for that. Thank you very much.